In this lecture, we will finish our discussion of preliminaries by looking at properties of the integers. We we'll begin with a couple of properties of, of the integers that are useful when proving statements involving the integers. The first property is the well-ordering principle. which we'll abbreviate WOP. The well-ordering principle states that every non-empty subset of the natural numbers or we can th think of it as the positive integers, has a least element. Now it can be shown that the well-ordering principle is actually equivalent to the principle of mathematical induction So officially, the principle of mathematical induction is a statement about sets of natural numbers, but in improving statements, is typically used in this following form. Suppose you have a proposition that depends on a natural number n. So I'm going to let p of n represent this proposition. So it depends on n, which is a natural number. And suppose that p of 1 is true. So the first proposition for n equals 1 is true. And if it happens that whenever p of n is true, then p of n plus 1 is true. Then we can conclude that p of n is true for all natural numbers n. So this is often how the principle of mathematical induction is used to prove statements. So it can actually be shown that the well-ordering principle is actually equivalent to the principle of mathematical induction. Next we'll look at some common definitions in involving integers. For integers a and b, we say that a divides b and we write a with a bar between B if there exists an integer C such that B equals 
a times c. So we say a divided b if we can write b as an integer multiple of a. Given non-zero integers a and b, the largest positive integer that divides both a and b is called the greatest common divisor of a and b. And this is denoted by parentheses a comma b parentheses, or is often called or written the GCD of, of a and b. So this is the largest positive integer that divides both A and B. Notice that the integer one will always divide A and B, so the greatest common divisor always exists for any two non-zero integers. But if the GCD of A and B actually equals one, then we say that A and B are relatively prime. Next we'll talk about the division algorithm for integers. Again, let's assume we have non-zero integers A and B. We can find unique integers q and r such that a can be written as q times b plus r where 0 is less than or equal to r which is less than the absolute value of b. So the idea is if we can, you can divide b into the integer a and the quotient is q and the leftover part, the remainder is r. So you can always write a as q times b plus r for unique integers q and r. Now I'll state an interesting fact about the GCD of A and B. So I'm actually going to state this fact without proof. This is a common fact that's, that can be demonstrated in um, a number theory text. So if A and B are non-zero integers, then there exists integers x and y such that ax plus by equals the greatest common divisor of a and b. So that is we can always write the greatest common divisor of A and B 
as an integer linear combination of a and b. So the greatest common divisor of a and b can be written as a integer linear combination of a and b and in fact the gcd of a and b is actually the smallest positive integer that can be written as an integer linear combination of a and b. So this fact can actually be um, useful in, in certain proofs. Next we'll define prime and composite integers. An integer p greater than 1 is called prime. if p has no positive divisors other than one and itself. An integer greater than one that is not prime is called composite. Here's another fact that of about prime numbers that we're not going to prove, but it is true. If P is prime, and P divides a product, P divides A times B for integers A and B, then we can conclude that P divides A or P divides B. Next, we'll state the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Which again, the proof can be found in any standard number theory textbook. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic states that every integer n greater than one can be factored into a product of primes Moreover, the factorization is unique up to order.
a very important function in number theory, which has applications in set theory and therefore in abstract algebra, is the Euler phi function. So for a positive integer n, phi of n denotes the number of positive integers less than or equal to n that are relatively prime to n. The number of positive integers a, which are less than or equal to n, with a relatively prime to n. So the GCD of a and n is 1. So a quick example, phi of 12 would represent the number of positive integers between 1 and 12 that are relatively prime to 12. So phi of 12 is actually equal to 4 since the only positive integers that are relatively prime to 12 are 1, 5, 7, and 11. The rest of the integers between 1 and 12 have a greatest common divisor greater than 1. Another example, phi of 7 is 6, and in fact, phi of any prime number, p, would be p minus 1, because all of the numbers between 1 and p minus 1 would be relatively prime to p. Next, we will discuss a very important set, which will be used in many examples in abstract algebra. This set is called the set of integers mod n. So here is the notation for the set of integers mod n. So the notation will become more clear when we discuss quotient groups later this semester. But for now, we'll just, we'll just use this notation and explain it a little bit later. So let's first define what it means for two integers to be congruent. So n is going to be a positive integer and given two integers a and b we say a is congruent to b mod n if n divides b minus a. So next we will show that congruence mod n is actually an equivalence relation on the set of integers. So congruence mod n is an equivalence relation. So for the proof, we need to show that congruence, the congruence relation is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Well, a is congruent to a mod n because n divides 0 
which equals a minus a. So a is congruent to a mod n. Now if a is congruent to b mod n, then by definition, n divides b minus a. But if a, n divides b minus a, it will also divide a minus b because a minus b is just the negative of b minus a. So n will divide a minus b and we see that b is congruent to a mod n. For transitivity, if a is going to run to b mod n and b is going to run to c mod n, then n divides b minus a and n divides c minus b. Well, if, if n divides two integers, it divides the sum of those two integers. So then n divides c minus b plus b minus a. This just equals c minus a. And that's the definition of a being congruent to c. In. So we see that congruence mod n is actually an equivalence relation. And we showed earlier that an equivalence relation on a set A would produce a partition on that set A. So we have an equ equivalence relation on the integers, and we see that these equivalence classes partition the integers. So given an integer a, we will denote the equivalence class of a as a with square brackets around it. So this is the equivalence class of A, which is by definition the set of all integers that are congruent to A mod N. So this, this equivalence class is also called the congruence class or residue class of A. And when we fix the modulus n, we see that this congruence class, or residue class, consists of all integers which differ from A by an integral multiple of n.
So that is the residue class of A is the set of all integers of the form qn plus a for some integer q. So any integer in this congruence class looks like a plus a multiple of n. So for example, it equals a, a plus or minus n, a plus or minus 2n, and so on, a plus or minus 3n. So these are the integers in the congruence class or residue class of A. So consider a, an arbitrary integer being divided by n. Since there are n possible remainders when dividing by n, we see that there are n distinct equivalence classes under congruence. Since there are n possible remainders when dividing an integer by n, we see that each one of these remainders will be a representative of a distinct residue class or congruence class under the congruence relation. So we see that there are n distinct equivalence classes under the congruence relation. These correspond to the n different remainders when dividing by n. So now consider the set of all these equivalence classes. So the equivalence class of zero, of one, of two all the way up to n minus one. So we see that every integer is contained in one of these equivalence classes because equivalence class of zero would represent any integer that's a multiple of n. Then the next element would be any integer that's one more than a multiple of n. And then any integer that's two more than a multiple of n and all the way up to integers that are n minus one more than a multiple of n. So these equivalence classes partition the integers and this set of equivalence classes is called the integers mod n and is denoted by z over n z. So again this is called the set of integers mod n. So again, this notation will be explained later when we discuss quotient groups, but think about it as n times z being every integer that is a multiple of n. And so if we take the integers and somehow divide out the multiples of n, you get these remainders. Okay, and so the set of equivalence classes are the so-called remainders when you're dividing the set of integers by uh, multiples of n. So this is a very important set that we will we'll see many examples involving the integers mod n. So we can actually define algebraic operations on the elements of the integers mod n.
given elements of the integers mod n, we can add them together, the residue class of A plus the residue class of B, we'll define that to be the residue class of A plus B, and we can define multiplication by the residue class of A times the residue class of B. We can set that equal to the residue class of A times B. And now we will, we will look at a theorem that states that these operations are actually well defined. In other words, they don't depend on the choices of representatives for the classes involved. So it's important to note that each residue class actually contains an infinite number of integers. So, but any one of those integers can be used as the representative for this, for these uh, residue classes. So let's write up this theorem. The operations on the integers mod n defined above are well defined. which means these operations do not depend on the choices of representatives for the classes involved. So for the proof of this theorem, we need to show that, that if the class of A1 equals the class of A2 and the class of B1 equals the class of B2, then when you add these classes together, it doesn't matter which, which representative you use. Then the class of A1 plus B1 will be the same as a class of A2 plus B2. So when adding classes, it doesn't matter which representative of the class you use for addition. And similarly, the class of A1 times B1 would be equal to the class of A2 times B2. So this is what we mean by well-defined. It doesn't, these operations do not depend on the representatives of the classes. So let's suppose that the class of A1 equals the class of A2. So if class of A1 equals the class of A2, that means that A1 is going to go into A2 mod n, and we're going to assume that B1 is going to go into B2 mod n. Then by definition of congruent, n divides a2 minus a1, and n divides b2 minus b1. Then n will divide the sum of a2 minus a1 and b2 minus b1. If n divides two numbers, it divides their sum. So then n divides 
a2 minus a1 plus b2 minus b1. Then rearranging these terms, we see that this equals a2 plus b2 minus the quantity a1 plus b1. But this is the definition of a1 plus b1 being congruent to a2 plus b2 mod n. So this shows that addition of congruence classes is well defined. In other words, the class of a1 plus b1 equals the class of a2 plus b2. Now we need to show that multiplication is well defined. So now we're assuming that n divides a2 minus a1 because a1 and a2 are congruent. And we know that n divides b2 minus b1. So by definition of divides, we know that a2 minus a1 is an integer multiple of n, so n times s. And we can also write b2 minus b1 as an integer multiple of n as well. So let's say n times t for some integers s and t. So then I can write a2 as n times s plus a1, and I can write b2 as n times t plus b1. And then when I multiply a2 times b2, we see that this implies that a2 times b2 equals ns plus a1 times nt plus b1. And when you multiply this out, we'll see that we get a1 times b1 plus a multiple of n. And so when I com combine all the terms together, I get a1 t plus b1 s plus n s t all times n. But most importantly to note is that this is an a1 times b1 plus an integer multiple of n. So this in turn implies that n will divide a2 b2 minus a1, b1, and that means that a1, b1 is congruent to a2, b2 mod n. And this, we can conclude that the residue class of a1, b1 is equal to the residue class of a2, b2, and therefore multiplication is also well defined. We'll end our discussion of properties of integers by defining multiplicative inverses in the integers mod n. So recall earlier that we stated that if a and n are relatively prime, so if the greatest common divisor of a and n is 1, then we can actually write 1 as an integer linear combination of a and n. So then there exists integers x and y. Such that ax plus ny equals 1. So in terms of congruences, we see that 
AX is actually congruent to one mod N. And, and therefore, the when I multiply the class of A times the residue class of X, that will equal the residue class of one in the integers mod n. So therefore we call the residue class of x, we call this the multiplicative inverse of the residue class of a in the integers mod n. Because when I multiply the class of a times the class of x, I get the class of one. So we call the class of X the multiplicative inverse of the class of A in the integers mod N. Now recall that if we look at the set of integers between zero and n minus one, there's exactly phi of n of these integers that are relatively prime to n where phi is the Euler phi function. So since there are phi of n integers in the set from zero, one, two, up to n minus one that are relatively prime to n, and each of these phi n, phi of n integers has a multiplicative inverse mod n, we see there are phi of n residue classes in the integers mod n that have a multiplicative inverse. So we will denote the set of these phi of n residue classes as the integers mod n and with an x in the exponent. So we see that this is the set of residue classes in the integers mod n such that the residue class of a times the residue class of x equals the residue class of one for some residue class X in the integers mod N. So these are the residue classes that have a multiplicative inverse in, in GN. And it turns out that these residue classes with multiplicative inverses are exactly the residue classes containing integers that are relatively prime to n. Because we see it's clear that if a is relatively prime to n, 
then every integer in the residue class of A will also be relatively prime to N. So it doesn't matter which representative of the residue class we're, we're talking about here. Let's end with a quick example. So on the integers mod 12, we know that there are four integers between 1 and 12 that are relatively prime to 12. So the set of residue classes that are, have multiplicative inverses are represented by the residue class of 1, the residue class of 5, the residue class of 7, and the residue class of 11. Because 1, 5, 7, 11 are all relatively prime to 12. So each one of these residue classes actually has an inverse, but each element is its own multiplicative inverse. This is because the residue class of 1 times the residue class of 1 is the residue class of 1 times 1. The residue class of 5 times the residue class of 5 is the residue class of 25, which is also 1 more than a multiple of 12. So this is equal to the residue class of 1, because 25 is congruent to 1, mod 12. And similarly, the residue class of 7 times itself would be equal to the residue class of 49, which is also congruent to 1 mod 12, 48 being a multiple of 12, and 11, the residue class of 11 times the residue class of 11 would be equal to the residue class of 121, which again is one more than a multiple of 12. So we see that each element in this set is its own multiplicative inverse.